Familiar Museum. Uh, we'll be beginning our program in just a few minutes, but we have some ground rules to go over, and I have to do my usual spiel. Uh, indulge me, please, with a show of hands. How many of you are here at the Milliard Museum for the first time today? Raise your hand. Okay, you can never say that again. That's what we've been having for a long time. Uh, this evening, the interest is most wanted is really the brainchild of this young lady, uh, our museum educator, Christy Ellsworth. We came across an old wanted poster from the Manchester Post Office from 1890, and the incredible line drawings of these most wanted, prior, prior to the FBI creating its most wanted list, uh, just sparked an idea in Christie's mind. Uh, we have been partnering with the Majestic Theater on a number of ventures, including our walking tours of the Manchester cemeteries, and so the notion of having their actors portray these nefarious villains uh, from the city's past just came to life. And apparently 160 of you thought it was worth coming today, so uh, we thank you for that. Uh, the bartenders, uh, Kale and Christy Ellsworth, are hard at work, we'll get that in that line. Yes, thank you. That means I'm not attending bar, because they are. <coughs> so again, uh, we're happy to have you here tonight. Uh, Karen Bissett from the Majestic Theater is here. Rob Dion, their president, is actually performing tonight in Maine, but uh, Karen is asked to say a few words, so if you help me get her up here. <laughs> on the way out. We have a, a bunch of these at the registration table. I'll give a little plug. Next weekend we have a wonderful show called Love Song and um, I hope you'll check that out or come see it's over on Page Street. Uh, we are always thrilled when John and Christy call and say we've got an idea. We, uh, we step right up and um, our actors are super excited to bring these portrayals to you and I hope you all have a wonderful, wonderful night. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, welcome to Manchester's Most Wanted 1896 edition. Um, we are so excited to have you here. We are so excited to have people in person eating and drinking and talking and not through a computer screen. Um, thank you so much for coming to join us. Um, the Majestic Theater has really outdone themselves this time. We have 10 actors um, portraying nefarious villains that were wanted here in Manchester. Some of them, um, their ties to Manchester are a little closer than just being wanted here. Um, make sure you visit America's first serial killer, H.H. H. Holmes. Um, he'll be in there. Um, and several other less menacing villains will delight you tonight. Um, with that being said, we have just a couple of ground rules. You all have a um, sort of checklist, like a scavenger hunt. I placed pencils all around the museum. So if you're type A and you need to physically check them off, that is fine. If you are not, you may just go about your way. So what we're gonna do in just a few minutes, I'm gonna ring this really obnoxious school bell. Um, and that'll be your turn to go out into the museum and find an actor. It doesn't matter who. Um, we are going to ring the bell nine times and you'll be able to switch actors. So with that being said, these villains are not really from 1896, so their memories have gotten a little foggy over the last hundred years. So we're gonna kind of stick to the script. If you have questions that are of a historical nature, um, myself or John or our Dan Peters, um, our archivist, he's hanging around somewhere, looking pretty dapper tonight. Um, we can maybe help you, although most of these um, villains have an assumed alias is. So we may not be able to tell you, we might just know what we know. Um, but we hope you have a wonderful night of frivolity, misdemeanors, and a little bit of mayhem. So with that being said, I'm gonna ring the bell. Um, go find your villain. <laughs> John McManus, also known as Kid McManus, James Martin, and James Murray. I think you'll all be very impressed with my long list of accomplishments, but I'll only share a few of my favorites. On June 27, 1883, I was sentenced to two years and six months for attempted grand larceny in the second degree. On the day after Christmas in 1885, I was found guilty of petty larceny. 
On July 19, 1887, July 19, 1887, the safe of George W. Fairchild's jewelry store in Bridgeport, Connecticut, was burglarized. More than $10,000 worth of jewels were stolen. We stretched a piece of dark canvas across the front of the safe with the outline of the safe drawn on it. That way, night watchmen on patrol can <laughs> look through the window and not see anything amiss. I was arrested in my brother's New York saloon on August 20th, 1887 after making a daring but unsuccessful dash for freedom. Even though I was set up in March 1888, I pled guilty and was sentenced to four years in the Connecticut State Prison in Wethersfield. I became a model citizen after this, as you can imagine, and only robbed several post office, restaurants, and clothing stores from 1895 and 1897. New York newspapers mentioned in May 1900 that I was operating successfully in Paris, France. What they didn't know is I continued to follow my passion until I was found guilty of multiple crimes and sentenced to six years in a Canadian penitentiary on December 18, 1901. I was released on May 8, 1908, and as you can imagine, I continue to be a passionate model citizen to this very day. <laughs> I, John Welsh, using the alias John Ward, was one of two men convicted of burglary in Birmingham, England. I received a five-year jail sentence, returning to the U.S. in 1887. In 1888, my buddy Joe Dollard and I robbed Chapman and Gale, a Norfolk, Virginia jewelry store of $38,000 worth of jewels, watches, and more. Although I was captured in Richmond on February 7th, there was insufficient evidence for a conviction and I was allowed to leave the state and head to New York. Well, on February 28th, 1895, a burglary was conducted at Post Office Station D in St. Louis, Missouri. More than $200 worth of stamps in various denominations were taken. But I knew nothing about this, of course. On March 10th, 1895, I was arrested with safe blowing tools in my possession. <laughs> the chief of police in St. Louis determined that even though I identified myself as James Wesley, I was actually John Welsh. He knew I had a national reputation for burglary and safe robbing and he knew that I had recently been released from Sing Sing in New York, serving two years for robbing a bank, which netted $500 cash and $10,000 in government bonds. Pretty good, eh? On October 5, 1895, my friend John Kidd McManus and I were arrested in New York as we prepared to sail for Europe. It was believed that we were involved in the robbery which a police officer was shot in Matawan Post Office on February 10th, 1893. The officer was unable to identify us in court, so we were released. Hey, kid, did you tell him about all your accomplishments? My name is Georgie Valier, but some people called me Georgie Adams. My name is Nellie Brown, but I'm also known as Nellie Woods. We went on trial in Boston in February 1896 for two counts of larceny. We were accused of putting a knockout drug in the beer of our victims. Some say 
We were responsible for several similar cases involving victims who awoke in hotel rooms without their valuables. During our trial, there was one man who had the, the courage enough to visit the court the mo in the morning to try to identify us as the guilty party. He was a conductor on the West End Railway who informed the court that a week prior he was the victim of knockout drops and believing Georgie and me to be those whom he had picked up on the street on the night in question. Despite un... un, un are you trying to say unenviable? Yes, unenviable. Oh, yes. oh my goodness. Notoriety. He would get by appearing at the trial. He knew he would aid the officers in trying to get us out of the way. The police believed us exceedingly dangerous at large. So laughable. We're so innocent. <laughs> Unfortunately, the gentleman caller identified us the moment he caught a glimpse of me, telling the court that he was satisfied that I was one of the two women who had not only rendered him unconscious, but who had also robbed him. According to his story, he was passing through a school square a week ago Tuesday night, dressed in his conductor uniform, when he was approached by us. We were merely asking him something regarding where we could get a car for a certain point. <laughs> he tried to answer our questions the best he could, but it was then that he became engrossed in a flirtation with us. <laughs> Well, in short time, we all became uh, well acquainted. <laughs> and it was suggested that we accompany him to the Randolph House on Friend Street, where we went for the purpose of having a drink. We entered a private room, and the drinks were ordered. The next morning, the gentleman caller discovered upon awakening that we had left his company. Figuring up his cash receipts for the day, he found that he was minus just $15 besides his watch. Hmm. We surely do not know how this would have happened. In March of 1896, a jury failed to reach a verdict on my guilt. I, however, was sentenced to three years in the House of Corrections and my motion for a new trial was overruled. Well, we look like we have a nice, kind gentleman here. Would you like to accompany us for a drink? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. That's my son. Thank you. That's good. <laughs> he likes to live life on the edge. Yeah. <laughs> to you or to the, uh, anybody? Okay. My name is Michael Sherlock. And I was born in New York in May 1862. I live a good life and I work very hard at my usual occupation as a, uh, as a streetcar conductor. <laughs> Many refer to me as a gentleman burglar of Stockbridge. On November 17, 1893, without invitation, I broke into and entered the Episcopal Rectory home of the Reverend W. M. Grosnever in Lenox, Massachusetts. After the Lenox incident, I continued the excitement and made my way to Stockbridge, where I stole a team of horses and escaped into New York State. <laughs> I was a free man. And I was a happy man. That is, until the law caught up with me. I was part of a gang of four believed responsible for multiple burglaries in Stockbridge, and accused of two unsuccessful attempts to rob the station agent at New Lenox. Of course, <laughs> that was the case of mistaken identity. Although I was wildly innocent of all these charges, in July 1894, I went on trial in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, charged with breaking and entering, and was sentenced to 15 years at the Massachusetts State Prison in Charlestown. I was even listed on the June 1900 U.S. Census for the Massachusetts State Prison in Boston. They only list innocent men on the census, isn't that right? <laughs> cool. Dive in, shall we? Oh. Good evening, folks. My name is James Canham Reed, and I was born in 1855 in North London, England. I'm a British bigamist, <laughs> uh, well, and a murderer, but um, I was employed also as a cashier at the Royal Albert Dock in London, while married with eight children. <laughs> I was also reported to have um, four simultaneous mistresses. <laughs> Always room for a fifth. I was known as the South End Murderer, the Printerwell Murderer, and my entire affair and aftermath is sometimes called the South End Mystery. <laughs> Friends and lovers. Uh, they would call me Jimmy Reed. 
However, I use multiple names to disguise my several relationships and have fabricated other false characters to help excuse my absences to my various partners. <laughs> Given the timing of the events and the publicity involved, the events of my life may have partially influenced Oscar Wilde's The Importance of Being Earnest, which was released the following year. Unfortunately, I wasn't around the following year to enjoy it, well, because, yeah. <laughs> my brother, Harry, and I jointly claimed a fictitious sister in Canterbury, married to an equally fictitious Walter Parker. The purpose of this was to create a character who needed help from time to time, but really to excuse my absences from my various relations. <laughs> from October of 1893 onwards, I made weekly pattern of spending Monday through Friday with my true wife, Emma, while on weekends I would spend my time with my mistress, Beatrice, <laughs> and neither one of them queried about this. <laughs> uh, but then it all came crashing down when one of my other mistresses, Florence, imagine the nerve, she found herself with child. And I was afraid that the whole web of tales would somehow come crashing down and everyone would find out about it. Oh, and I just couldn't have that. So I'm sure you're all thinking the same thing I am. There's only one possible solution <laughs> to this dilemma. Florence. <laughs> End of problem. Well, I was charged with a murder and was executed by hanging on December 4th, 1894 at Springfield Prison in England and buried in an unmarked grave on the prison grounds. That is my story and personally I think my only true crime is loving a little too much. <laughs> and creative solutions perhaps. <laughs> Thank you all. Good evening. How are you all tonight? The name is Andrew J. Freeman, but my friends call me James Williams. It's always good to have an alias. I was convicted for being a post office thief, a highwayman, and my personal favorite, a gentleman burglar. You know what that is, right, dear? Oh, yes. A gentleman Absolutely. burglar. <laughs> I came to Boston in the 70s and immediately after was sentenced to imprisonment for stealing a valise. We know what that is. It's a suitcase, dear. It's a suitcase. <laughs> after serving my time, I headed down to New York and I led a life of petty thievery there. And once I was caught, unfortunately, I was sent to Blackwell's Island. Do you all know where that is? It's in the East River. I guess they renamed it to Roosevelt Island. Oh, okay. Across from Manhattan. I don't know who this Roosevelt is, but he must have been popular. So after that, when I got out of that prison, I went up to Lawrence, Massachusetts, and for a crime there, I was sent to 10 years imprisonment at the Charlestown State Prison. I made a desperate escape to a, attempt to escape but I was discovered and recaptured after I seriously wounded two guards. But it was good because when I was thrown back into prison, I was put into the machine shop where I was able to make a whole plethora of burglar tools, which came in handy because I had to cut my way through two iron doors, three feet of granite, and then after having another kerfuffle with two more guards, I was able to successfully escape that prison. Then afterwards, I went down to New York to continue a life of crimes and misdemeanors. And, of course, gentleman burglary. <laughs> afterwards, I went up to Lewiston, Maine, and where some believe that I continue my life of crime, of robbing post offices, houses, and general thievery. I admit that Maybe I did commit some of those crimes, but I always maintain my innocence. 